Greetings and welcome to the Primitive Man Sounds podcast. I'm your host, Dakota Brown. Let's take a journey into the sonic void of space and time where I focus on preserving the voices and sounds of the underground generations and other elements that I find most compelling, fascinating, and inspiring about the world and the people in it. If you like what we do here at Primitive Man Sounds, you can always show some love by supporting our Patreon at www dot patreon.com slash primitive man sounds podcast thank you to all the listeners and enjoy the show John, how's it going, buddy? How are you? I'm good. It's been a tumultuous few days, but everything is slowly settling, and I have a moment now, so that worked out good. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah, you mentioned that you're working on some new material. Yeah, we've just finished recording our new record, and I'm finishing up the mix of today, like setting up the mock-up for the mastering guy, JJ, that we always use. And I'm in the process of closing the castle space office, which has been fucking grueling. But Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. That's all right. It's uh, it, it's not over. I just need to reboot because our overhead was way too high and the label was in debt. It's just a long story. Man, so man, thinking, you know, yeah, thinking, so, you know, that that's right. crazy, man. That's yeah, some something that your your work ethic, man, is so inspiring. <laughs> that's man, you I are think- you are a troop, man. You have been you have been at this for so long and you've created such a monumental body of work man i just wanted to start off by saying that just I've, I, you know having been a fan for for a number of years man you are you are very very disciplined artist man it's incredible thank you man i mean i really don't want to do anything else so i'm happy to be you know where i'm at and what i'm doing I'm very, i feel very fortunate to have this be my life that I can make art, you know, as a, for a living, you know, be able to travel the world and play shows for people and meet people who are engaging and interested and stuff like this. So it makes me happy too, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, I feel like, isn't that the goal? I mean, in any, any profession, whether you're musician or, you know, a doctor, whatever it is, I mean, you kind of want to be around that ecosystem, but yeah, man, being, being an artist full time and, and that being like, you know, not only your, your, your sense, you know, your ways of bringing in income, but to also fulfill your, your life's journey, man. I mean, that's, it's, yeah, dude, I mean, it's that dream. I would hope for anybody that they're, they're, they're one thing that they could gain in life is to be happy with what they're doing because I've had every kind of shitty job you can have pretty much. I did all those jobs for years to, you know, to, to subsidize my, you know, flailing art career at the time. Um, it took a long time. I not until in my thirties was I able to like probably around thirty five or so I was able to finally like stop working at like a grocery store. You know what I mean? Wow. But actually, the grocery store was a really good job. I don't mean to. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was one of the better jobs I had. Right, like, right, right, right. Uh, you know, like being a bike messenger, or shit like that, just exhausting shit, or painting houses or something that got really old for me. Although I tell you what, I can paint their shit out of a house. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say you're a Swiss <laughs> Army man at this point, man. <laughs> yeah i'm really good at paint i mean i'm also irish i think it comes to the territory but i'm yeah. very good at paint. <laughs> but uh, you know and like that's that's one thing is like these these kind of jobs aren't for everybody and like so like no matter what you're doing i hope you can find something that makes you happy because that's a big part of your life is spent like you know finding a way to feed yourself or fill up your time you know? it, so, it, it really is man and and i, I something else i want to ask you i mean what and I'm sure you know at this at this point in your life and in your career, but what has really been some of the driving elements that has kept you going, that has made you get in the studio time and time again, tour? I mean, because that breaks, I mean, that breaks down people. And I, and I know you've seen it. I mean, some people are just like, oh, yeah. I can't do this. Or I need to yeah. do this a different way. But what has really kept you centered through this whole journey to where you can now kind of reflect back and be like, all right, like I've, I've, I'm making this work for myself. Like this is, this worked. 
Yeah, man, I think uh, as far as touring goes, I do believe that not not everybody's cut out for it. It's hard work. I, 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 I don't mind driving in a van all day for some reason. I mean, sedentary life, that, that takes its toll. I definitely got to, like, work out in the morning or go for a run before we do that or before the show. Right. Sort of get pumping. That's fucking exhausting. But I think... Overall, you know, it's like a 50-50 thing. You know, some people are just musicians who just don't want to tour, which I totally understand because it's not comfortable. You're not at home. But at this point, my band's been doing it long enough. We make enough money that we can all get hotel rooms. So everybody has their own space, you know. And there's like a weird little – I don't – I don't. I really don't know why I, I don't mind it. I just don't, you know. I mean, it's tiring for me too. This year, I believe, actually, will be my last year doing a month-long tour because we break up the U.K. and Europe into two 15-day stretches usually now, which is pretty easy. And uh, especially now that Brexit happened, because you don't really want to be crossing the border back and forth on tours anymore. If you can help exit split gear and merchandise, just a fucking pain in the ass. That right. That shit. So that sort of worked out perfectly for that. But in the States, we would always do a month. And this September coming up, we're going to be doing a month. And uh, that just now, you know, I'm almost 50 now, man. And it starts to like, it started a great, not great, but like, it's just like, you know, by the end, I'm just worn out now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Every, every, day, every show. So I think man. the 15 days. We'll do a West Coast with a little bit of Central America, or uh, or rather the Midwest, and same thing for the East Coast kind of thing. I think we can make it work a little better going forward. But that was something you know you have to adapt and change. But we've never gone over to a bus. We don't have a big crew. We usually have like these days we've been traveling with one sound person and like maybe two merch people. Um, and that still you know makes it so the band can get paid well. And we have we, we keep a very low overhead. You know we yeah. have a sp- we we rent a sprinter. So I think, I think part of it was keeping it simple, you know? Yeah. Um, And you know, the business of it, like that's all, that's another thing, right? Like there is the dream and there's this, this fire in, in your heart to get out there and do it as you've been, you've been, you've been doing this for decades, but you also have had to learn the, the the business side. (laughs) Yes. Like I know, I know like lingo now. Yeah. Walk out, you know. I said that to a guy up from other He's like, "What's walk out?" I was like, "How much money am I walking out the door with?" Dude? Right. It's like, it's like those old country guys back in the day in the '60s and '70s or whatever. They were just yep. going around in cap, they were just hitting the road to make money. And basically, that's that's like half of my band's income is probably from touring. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. I, and in the merch too, I worked in the merch industry up until actually about two months ago for almost three years. And man, I. I had no fucking clue. I was so oblivious to the amount of money that bands, you know, rely on and and bring in just from merch when they're not on stage selling tickets. It's crazy. I don't know, I don't know what's going on, but t-shirts are just like like we barely need to bring records on the road anymore. Most of the people that come to our shows, I feel like already have most of the records, whether yep. it be digital, vinyl, via mail order. Yep. But t- on the road or like dude they want that 35 45 dollar t-shirt all day and it's just from us, man. We're still well good for you man i <laughs> good for you i have seen t-shirts go in that 35 45 and it's like i don't give a fuck who this is yeah. like 40 bucks for a t-shirt <laughs> it's I bella mean, canvas I bought a slayer bandana for 25 dollars one time i can tell you for the most part why that is though um that i mean a little bit of it's greed but right i mean i get it right it's yeah no, but there's this precedent set by clubs and festivals now which is complete horseshit yep the terrible model nobody likes it where they take 20 to 25 there, there's too many people involved man it's like as soon as you get there it's like oh my god man it's it's it, it almost like for some reason this popped in my head the the uh, song remains the same movie where you know, Peter Grant, whatever that dude's name was, was like pissed off because all these people were, you know, cutting off the top and like all this stuff. And it's like people don't understand. It's like there are so many moving pieces having to pay the venues, having to pay the people that are working there. I mean, everybody's almost got. And correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, it's almost like everybody has like this set quota before they even have you open the door? You know what I mean? It's There's like certainly a lot of overhead at some venues, in particular with larger venues. But I will say this: with that twenty percent taken on merchandise, a lot of people jack their prices up. We often will just try and lie to the club until we didn't sell anything. Right, <laughs> but, right. But but the thing is, is here's my one piece of advice: anybody traveling and they have a club that wants to hit them up for merchandise uh, percentage, ask them what it's for because most places, some places, it is for tax. There's legit joints like I know, like I think like North Carolina. 
they're supposedly paying tax, and they are because of that, they're automatically giving you paperwork for that money, and that's a tax right off of your Ah, uh, okay. Legit. Little little but back end clubs, work there. Just, some clubs are just taking that fucking money for no reason. So what I do is I'm like, what's it for? And if they don't know, then I'll, I'll argue with them about it. But like, look, man, I'm not just going to give you money for no reason. Right. And then also, I'll be like, can I get a receipt? And a lot of times, it's just some bouncer at the end of the night with his hand out, and I'm like, can I get a receipt? And that dude will just be like, never mind. And yep, yep. Like, oh. He doesn't have a receipt. I'm, like, I'm not giving you money without, like, <laughs> some way of me saying that i gave this guy these hundreds of dollars at the end of the night here in canada or whatever you yeah know, man random. you you but fucking get it dude you are random. yeah man you're an i mean you're an independent music i mean you 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 are a legend at this point i mean you have been running this shit for so long man i mean you you fucking totally understand and if anybody doesn't understand just uh, i mean dude fogarty just got his rights back for the ccr stuff like this week it's like just look around like you don't have to go out there and like get burned alive just look at the 60s and 70s and like all of our like psychedelic pioneer groups i mean these dudes are in their 70s now and they're like still fighting for the eight yeah. songs they wrote back in 68 you know what i mean particularly got fucked and I'm, I'm guessing part of that seemed like it was out of spite because i think fogarty probably doesn't put up with a lot of shit and the impression i got was that and th this is probably completely ignorant. This is just an impression, but that they were trying to like hammer something out with Fogarty. He basically just told him to go fuck himself. Right, and right. It turned into like a 20 year thing where like he couldn't even write a song unless they compared it in court to an old song of CCR. Dude, like, you know, insanity. That, that particularly dragged <laughs> behind the truck there. You know what I mean? I love CCR too. So that was always sort of painful for me to think about. Yeah, man. And, and so many of those other bands, man. I mean, it's just because you got to think about it, man. I mean, as you very well know, I mean, you've got these these suits man the, the, these these talking heads or whatever i mean those guys back then were you know maybe middle age and they're just taking advantage of like 19 and 21 year old kids essentially you know yeah. i mean it's and they don't know they just they just want to be on the tv show they want to play the circuits like whatever i mean they're just trying to do it but i feel like nowadays man i feel like you have so much more control you know starting your own label and just having more of your own types of people kind of control. I mean, as you very well know, I mean, you just want to keep it in house as much as possible. So you can kind of really do damage control and make sure that everybody is benefiting off of their creations, which is, that's not much to ask for. And, and no one should have to ask for that. I mean, that's, that's always the, the devastating side of it, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. Yeah. I mean, keep things as simple as possible on my end. It always, the more the more success you have, the more of a pain in the ass it is. I mean, more money, more problems is absolutely true. Absolutely, but, man. Like, like, but I still try and keep it. A, I mean, I'm not by any means good with numbers or accounting, so I really try and keep it as boneheaded as possible. Right, That's, right. Plus, I usually try and hire somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing to, you know, finalize tours and stuff. Like that. Like, that's why I have Michelle at Panache. She's fantastic. And actually, she's been running the show on that end for me for a long time now. That's she's incredible. Is terrifying to those promoters. So that's okay. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm also really curious to know. I'm, I'm always some another reason I really wanted to start this podcast last year is I'm, I'm always curious to know the emotional and the mental side. Obviously, you know the, the spiritual side as well of of the music. And how do you, on a personal level, how how do you keep it all separate? How do you keep your your music career and your art separate from just like your day to day, like your, your, your relationships that you have, or just, just keeping all of that separate, because that's one of those things, man, is all that stuff kind of gets blended together and bleeds over and it, it can cause a lot of issues for people, you know? Yeah, man, I would certainly say that my life sort of revolves around my art. Like I've always made it about the work and it's been, you know, detrimental to some point with some of my relationships, but it is what it is, man. Like, I, I mean, you're on a I mission. <laughs> try, yeah, I try my best to make time for other people and things and also to uh, to uh, take a moment and take a breath sometimes. But yeah. it is, it, it's hard for me to relax. I do. I do. It's it's an issue weirdly i just seem to have this endless desire to do this so like i don't i sometimes it's hard to like actually like pay attention and listen when this is bothering somebody else <laughs> right 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 i, I understand that 
my relationships with men and women that like people are very like understanding of who I am when they get right. I think it's like obvious what what my deal is. I'm pretty I'm pretty what you see is what you get. In Absolutely. General, little east coast thing where there's not a lot of hidden layers to me it's like i definitely care too much right out of the gate so like <laughs> it, you know but i i don't i mean i definitely have my downtime and stuff but the band is my life and like um making music is my life you know like i'm always all about trying to play with new people going to see shows for instance i never i have this like pathological fear of becoming one of those people who's a musician who stops going to see other bands like, I was hmm, like when I that see happens music, man that happens. You just stay in your own little echo chamber of, you know what I mean, of your own sound, and it's like turn everything else off. I still enjoy seeing other people's work, and uh, I mean, a while back we were at uh, my friend really likes Mr. Bungle, so I got us tickets for that. We went to go see him, and it was like I forget who was opening, maybe like Pig Destroyer. But while we were standing there, we were standing next to the guy from Bruharia, and I was like, <laughs> nice. That still goes out and sees shows, you know, like yeah, his bands of all time just standing there next to us with a beer in his hand. I was like, hell yeah. It, like, it doesn't you know, end, man. Like you, it, it doesn't end when it comes to, you know, these types of people. I mean, they, they're, they're true to that nature. I mean, they're still that 13, 14 year old that wants to see music and wants to feel that music, you know? Absolutely. And I definitely have my head up my own ass. I don't mean it that way. Like, it's hard. <laughs> I have to, I have to make an effort to take myself out of, like I have usually for me it's like time in between tours or time in between records like right now is one of my busiest times of year with the band we've been writing recording I opened a new studio we recorded our new record as the first people recording in that studio so there was a lot of uh of, of uh hurdles to get to where I am today yeah you know, over the past but it's it's you know I'm good at ticking off boxes too man that's that's one of my gifts so like we're there yeah it's just been like I need to like, like basically I was, when we were in the studio, I was just coming home, like reading for like an hour, going straight to bed, which is really not like me, but I was just like, for like 20 days straight, I was like, man, I haven't been anywhere. I need to go out. You know? <laughs> yeah. Is, right? You need to see some like, civilization. <laughs> yeah. You got it. You do have to watch that level, you know, but I think I'm a little bit of a workaholic that way. So uh, I'm kind of, that's, that's my like dopamine high is to like get there, you know? Hey man, whatever, whatever fills your soul, man. That's, that's always the goal. When, so man, when did you initially, I want to kind of back it up a little bit. When did you initially start playing guitar, man? When did, when did this, when did this all start for you? Um, pretty, pretty young, I guess, but not, not really until I was in my twenties. I, uh, really? Okay. I got, yeah, I got a guitar for like my, I told my mom I wanted a guitar, I think. And I think she got me a cherry red, like heavy metal pointy headstock Chevelle. Wow. Like, <laughs> on it. Like, yeah. <laughs> one of the corniest, hardest, uh, hardest to make work good. And like a crate amplifier, you know? Yeah, man. And, that was my first amp, actually. Crates. <laughs> 212. Got me this. Had like a distortion button. Yep, yep. But, uh, that almost immediately got stolen from me. A house I lived in with a bunch of other people. Uh, we were selling LSD at raves, and while we were out, <laughs> when that broke in, it fucking burned the house to the ground. So I lost. Oh all my that. god! But I didn't really play then, man. I just wasn't interested for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, a little bit here and there, I would jam with my friend Robbie sometimes. But were you and listening to music and consuming music? Yes. Then it was like, it was funny. I was like, just following everything around me. So things like, like I started with ACDC. That was my first love. And then kind of moved on to like punk, got into skateboarding, got into like Bad Brains, The Cramps. Yeah, the man. Surface. Black Flag and yeah. Surface punk, you know. And then uh, got in, really got into metal. Because I had a lot of metalhead friends in high school. So we'd go see like Metallica and Slayer and Flotsam and Jetsam. And all the, there were a lot of local metal bands in Providence too, like Flam and Angel Rot. A lot of good shit coming out of my hometown found that was like all ages shows um and then kind of like i said started selling lsd at raves and started following electronic music a little bit uh mostly due to the fact that we would take acid at the raves and that was really uh that first i was like i'm not into this at all and then i dosed at one of the shows and i was like holy shit yeah you're like now i get it <laughs> <laughs> He's like beat matching and slowing, slowing yeah time, essentially. <laughs> but um so that opened up my world to a bunch of other stuff things like and i had friends who were into like you know, sort of more experimental electronic tip stuff like legendary pick dots or uh, skinny puppy or coil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robin Gristle, uh, Chris, Cozy, Chris and Cozy. Just, you know, started and I 
definitely finally heard can which was sort of like a, a turning point in my life that was like the fulcrum of my being like propelled into wanting to play music like absolutely man and that, that made me want to play guitar and started jamming with everybody i could i got really hungry and of course i started that band is so specific that I, nothing i was playing was anywhere in the realm of kraut rock you know i was playing like rock and then i heard like bands like i even got into like really like guitar centric bands of like the 90s like uh Polvo and mercury rev and like just sort of weird like indie rocky kind of but like on the weirder side you know, yeah 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 Sonic Youth, for instance, as well, like alternate tunings, Glenn Branca, started really getting into the guitar, and then had a couple bands. I was in a band called Landed in Providence. That was like my first real band that I was in, who toured a little bit and kind of got a name for ourselves because their singer was a psychopath. <laughs> that was fun, but I, I didn't like their system of payment, i.e. never got paid for anything. Right, so right. That's why, to this day, I still pay everybody in the band evenly. Because I was like, fuck this feeling. This is a, like, we have a pretty socialist organization in the OCs with the exception of some like, to- like management payments and, uh, and like expenses. Other than that, everything's pretty much cut evenly. Uh, right. Like a, like a pie. Um, so I can thank them for that. But then by the time I moved to San Francisco, I, got, I really got into guitar when I moved to San Francisco because I was alone. Like, I was lonely. I only knew one guy and his roommates like peripherally. And I started playing a lot of acoustic and I got really into like, John Fahey, Elizabeth Cotton, Mississippi John Hurt, yeah, uh, Gibbs Spence, like all those open tuning blues players, and started learning how to do finger picking, and that was something I could do, like sort of alone, you know. And Brooke and I had a four track I brought with me, so I did a lot of four tracking, and then slowly just started playing with more people out in California and, and getting him kind of more back into like punky party rock kind of shit, you know. Wow, I was very fortunate to move to San Francisco at a time when I did, where it was just like drunk with great players and yeah. a good band. There was like a real weird androgynous underground scene of punk stuff and great metal and uh you know and now I live in LA which is essentially the same vibe of like a, a bunch of young kids making interesting shit which is always cool. That's incredible. And I mean and of course you you've been in these areas for so long so I mean you've you've seen the different ecosystems evolve i mean kind of from an aerial view as well as being in the middle and participating yourself but i I imagine that's been really humbling to just see it change just over and over and over you know but still arrive back at people doing what they want to do and 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 expressing the things that they're feeling you know i get really excited by new waves of creative because in between that i'm really heavily opinionated and a bit of a bitch about it so if I don't like it, I just really won't like it. And right, right. A much more extreme example of this, where there was students, you know, it was like a college town where I grew up. So I was a townie. And then we'd have like, you know, Lightning Bolt and Arab on Radar. And yeah, and yeah. And Bill Sound System, and like all these amazing bands all at the same time. And then those bands would break up or people would move away. And then there'd be like, you know, five years of just shitty bands. Right, or like, right. Or just okay bands. You know, like they'll get you by. Because it's like, you know, it's like drugs or something where there's just like a, a drought of like it was back when I was a kid there would be droughts of marijuana where you'd be like fuck yep. that's pretty cool. that's <laughs> yeah. that doesn't really happen anymore in Not, the city. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some kid in the Midwest smoking resin right now but right you know, but out here out here it moves much faster there's a lot more people there's a lot more kids coming in but there's yeah. a lot of young great young punk out here right now uh super far out hip hop coming out all over the country I've been hearing lots of interesting shit uh you know, and of course, with the addition of things like Spotify and shit, uh, and I, I mean, YouTube is still my big one for hunting stuff. Because definitely, reason, man, their algorithm is always nailed for me. Where like, I'll open up YouTube and I'll be like, "What's that weird looking record?" I'm like, "Damn, that's pretty good." Like, it knows what I like. Exactly, and it was uploaded in like 2007, 2008. And you're like, "All right, this yeah. is cool. This has been on the internet for I was whatever." When I get a video that's like 13 years old, I'm like, "Yes." Yep, <laughs> it's been on the internet since the internet, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, like so there's always somebody commenting like who's here 20 years later still yep yep <laughs> like, i always love that comment some people be like i was here when this first came out 20 years ago dude that's and that's how it is and especially with skateboarding i skateboarding is what really did it for me i mean having grandparents that got me into the classics but yeah man skateboarding in the early 2000s for me is what introduced me to all music and of course you know getting a getting a desktop and getting on youtube and just being able to you know, watch old 
girl videos from the 90s and you know chocolate or whatever it is and then there's this amazing right. plethora of music hip-hop rock and roll you know whatever it is and it just introduced you to so much i mean it's i i stand by you when it comes to youtube for sure man i'm i'm an old school youtuber too so that's you got to represent that <laughs> find social media completely exhausting and to be fair youtube has a little bit of that but I, I just can't i can't bring myself to do it and also i mean i'm on spotify mostly because kids were at merch camp like why are you not on spotify? right they're the ones calling you out <laughs> like, Fuck it. If this is the only way you're gonna listen to the record i'll put it up there right but exactly the same with youtube though their their model of payment to bands is shit it like, is i can't about to say this but i stand with taylor swift on everything she has to say about music ownership and payment of bands like it's just like it's absurd this commodity has been uh like neutralized by these platforms yeah so, you know now you hope to be become viral to actually make some real fucking money you yep. have to be played millions of times and even then it's still a pittance compared to like let's say if somebody was buying your song like off of a great place like Bandcamp. like I love right band camp. yeah band camp is still I, holding in they sold to epic which is a little terrifying to fans i think of band camp but as of yet, I don't think they've changed much. So yeah, it, it's crazy how there's no money coming from Spotify and like all these different platforms. But that's the double edged sword: is you have to have those to some extent. I mean, you have I to remember, have. You know what I mean? Yeah, back in the day, on a more physical level, but still with a sort of thread to what we're talking about, like a bigger band would offer us to open for them. You know, and I'd be like, sure, how much is the band? They're like, 100 bucks. I'd be like, 100 bucks? It's like a 2,000 seat theater. And I'd be like, I know everybody is there, there to see you, but that's fucking absurdly low. Like, yeah. And that was the precedent then. And this is the same. But they would always say the same thing. They're like, well, exposure. And I'd be like, fuck off. With your yeah, exposure. it's exposure. Like, that's always the payoff, man. 10 million yeah. listens and three bucks of earning. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. Same thing, man, where they're just trading, um, you know, they're trading you, quote unquote, exposure for you to give them an ownership of your product you know it's 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 a, it's a complicated situation i also don't think there's anywhere to fight it so that's why i'm in you know but yeah like in relay like yeah, yeah man like it's this. i always i i always get asked by people and I've, I've come to understand and at the end of the day you just have to ask yourself is it worth your time if you can kind of simplify it that way but a lot of people are like yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do your podcast or I'll, I'll do this, blah, blah, blah. How many followers do you have? What, what's your this, that, and the other. And man, it just, I will understand and sympathize with that statement to an extent, but my immediate reaction, and maybe I'm being hostile and insecure, but my immediate reaction is what the fuck does it even matter? No, you know what? I can 30 right people now. are going to listen to this and then it's going to get buried. Like what, yeah. what's it matter? You can tell them I said so. If anybody asks you that specific question, they're a fucking asshole. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even look up how many people you had on your podcast or how many followers you had. Honestly, what I looked up was what you were talking about and who you had interviewed. That's like, exactly. And John, I appreciate, I, I, especially I, coming I from you, man. Twenty people hear this. Who gives a fuck? I, I dude, what? Them. Yeah, what you just said is what the whole fucking thing is, man. Is I hope <laughs> that whoever I contact that would like to participate in the interview or the podcast aspect of it is they feel comfortable and they feel like it's something that is good for them. That's, yeah. that's the fucking goal, man. Everything that's else is like by the, by the, by the, the need for uh, approval that has come into play with, you know, uh, internet. Yeah, man. And I fall guilty to it. I fall guilty to it all the time, man, but I try and really exercise. Yeah, man. I try and really exercise like, the intentions but it it's 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 wicked man and i mean and, and speaking to you i mean you were doing this you were putting your art out there way before any of this shit had i mean i'm i'm so fortunate for that that i'm used to and i remember what it was like yeah before. i can't even fathom where we're headed next i'm at that age now where is like, but that's the thing man is does there always have to be a next yeah. like does it how clear does the water have to be before it just disappear you know what i mean like where is the yeah. ceiling i've i don't like everybody's like progress progress and it's just like i i don't really I see where the progress is going i'm completely we i've been on this conversation with my friend all week who's a graphic designer about basically ai artwork and i've been I, seeing I, that 
So it's it's fascinating to me, and it's totally it is very impressive, and it works really well. And I find it completely repulsive. Yeah. And I watched an interview with a woman who was basically I don't know if she's a creator, but she's one of the heads that was the face of Dolly. And wow. she was such an idiot about the way she like talked about it. And they're like, well, what about people who like everything every time? But they basically raised the problem. She was just diffusing it by being like, yes, it's definitely worth having a conversation about that. And I was like, so you haven't had a conversation about this exact thing before you release this to the public. Exactly. Like, it's like, well, it's like, well, it's too late to have a fucking conversation because it's already out there. And now everybody's you know, listening. Opinion, it's like it's like taking it's basically making this movement with AI and it's the same with music, with audio, with film, yep. whatever's yep. coming, whatever, whatever's coming to, down the pipe is preparing us, in my opinion, to be uh, a world of nothing but consumers and no creatives. Yep. You know, that, I, I mean, we, we're already there, there, man. It's something. yeah, man. Yeah, I know. I know. But I've heard these artists defending themselves who are using AI in their artwork as like, they're like, well, I still have to do something. You're like, no, you don't bitch. Yeah. You that, that's, the that's the thing. You don't, that's the thing. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, is amazing. I'm not knocking what they've done. I'm like, yes, this is very impressive. That does look like a, a Picasso in 15 seconds. Well done. But if it's to be said that that doesn't take some of the magic out of it, then yes. what the fuck is wrong with you? you that's, know, just, like, that's it, man. That's that's the magic of it. Dead. I'm hoping to be dead before the shit really hits me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I was like, in all likelihood, that's not actually true anymore, though, because you know this is going to be here in like two years now. Yeah, man, it's 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 around the corner. <laughs> but you have to go to shows. Like that's the thing, man. Is like without calling it anything, but just kind of being a you know a purist about it and having I don't know going to shows like buy things that you that you to, to support people. I mean, it really goes back to very simple fundamentals, very- man for that we have we're so lucky with our fans who are people that still want to come to shows and to buy shit so you know i have people being like you know like i i, I ripped this off the internet and i'm like that's okay like if that doesn't make me mad i'm like yeah i don't hate you, <laughs> you know? but i'd rather they just have it than if they're not gonna pay for it. you know what i mean exactly that's exactly very important that our, our, our people are like hardcore and passionate enough that they want to they want to help us out and keep us going you know absolutely well man tell me tell me this and i know you've probably been asked this but this is something that even though it's you know it's over and it's not over but what impact has the had the pandemic put on you on a personal and on an artistic level somebody that is such a veteran as yourself you're not doing what you've been doing for 30 plus years or whatever. You're not doing that anymore for almost two years. What, how did you navigate all that? I know you still put out bodies of music. I know you, you probably didn't stop your momentum at all, but no live music, no connection, no energy. How did you, how did you deal with all that shit, man? Well, I smoked more weed than usual. That's for sure. And I managed, <laughs> I don't know, somehow got through it. It, it, I, I certainly medicated myself to the point where, like, the blur of days, I read a lot, I played a lot of music, I worked on a film that I still have a lot of work to do on, but um, so basically, so like, okay, so for instance, at first, I was very reluctant to do streaming, because I was like, I do not want this to become the norm. Right, yeah, want, exactly. Like, this was normalizing this sort of behavior where, like, you can just sit at home in your sex pod and watch the show from there. Yep, like, for $25 yeah. or nothing. <laughs> Exactly. But then there came the point where I was bored enough that I was like, fuck it, let's do it. And then we had a really good time doing it because we were just doing covers and stuff. Right, right. We ended up doing three of them over the two years. But, um, you know, as far as COVID goes, it certainly changed things. Um, I'm a believer in COVID. I'm a believer in the vaccines. Same, same. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> like fighting that off. I've been... Right. Vaccinated, I think four times. I've had COVID three times. Jesus. I just had COVID like three weeks ago. That was the first first time I've gotten it since the vaccines. And it's still scary, man. It, it definitely scared me. And I mean, it's it's to be taken yeah, fucking serious. Funny. I had very I had it late, you know, so I had it after the first wave, which is really the one I think that you wanted to worry about. Yes, but, you got you got it when it was still really scary to get it. No, I got it. I got it like right about Omicron. So it wasn't. Oh, okay, okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's different. It's different for everybody, but um, for me, it was just like a cold, which I was very fortunate about. Like I've certainly been much, much sicker with like a flu or in the hospital for like blood poisoning, for instance. Um, Wow. Unrelated, I know, but still, um, 
you know, that's when I would end up staying home and working on a record for seven days. <laughs> yeah, you're like, all right, I'm 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 every locked into the house. Like, yeah, it was the perfect time for me. I got very fortunate with every aspect of it. That being said, I was the first one out the door of anybody I know to go to Europe and play shows when this sort of started to slow down a little bit. We played we we managed to tour uh two years ago in november of europe and then they basically closed on europe as we were leaving again like we were like struggling to get out wow um, but I, like i told my booker that i was like i'm so over this that i'm gonna be the first one in line although i'm totally aware of the dangers it's like somebody needs to get back out and do this shit because even now um i don't think it's necessarily out of fear of covid anymore but something has happened to people i think where they got used to being at home everybody yep. aged but everybody got a little bit slower i think so too man people got more anxiety so like our we, we will have a we'll have a show that sells out literally this happened the other night in uh, berkeley we played a venue that was like maybe 1200 capacity or 1300 and uh it sold out as we were walking on stage They're damn dude that's crazy <laughs> but it's like as we're getting on stage guys like we just sold the last ticket i was like jesus christ like look like it wasn't going to happen because people aren't buying tickets really in advance so much and i think a lot of bands are struggling with it yep uh being afraid to book too much luckily for my band we're just pigs so we'll just do whatever right right Um, so we just keep trying you know we throw whatever but we've definitely had some some shortages of tickets being sold uh or things going very slowly you know it's just, it is what it is, man. Like, I don't know, I don't know if that's going to change anytime soon. I mean, yeah. I have friends that are still terrified that are walking down the street, walking their dogs with masks on. Yeah. And we're perfectly healthy people. So it's like, it's, it's just affected everybody differently. You know, I, so I, I agree, man. It was, it was a universal and a very individual experience all in the same, you know. I have, you know, I can't judge anybody, but I only know how I feel. Exactly. I kind of could give a fuck anymore. I mean, well, because it's either that, man, you live in fear. Yeah, you live in fear, but you're looking around. Everybody else is still getting their nut. Everybody else is still fucking up the world or or doing or, you know, or doing whatever they're doing. That's good. I mean, you have to like you. That's the thing, man, is you have to live your life. You have to spend your time. Well, for my mental health, I certainly needed to. uh, I did my due diligence. I wore a mask for like two and a half years and and got all the vaccines and stayed home and stayed home certainly when I was sick. But there just came a point where like it was time to start touring again. And basically, I've always followed the CDC guidelines, whatever the rules of the club are. But that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, (laughs) that's your part. That's your part, man. until Until everything closes again, which who knows, um, I'll be touring, you know, nonstop because that's what I do. That's That's how I live. You know that's what you do man that's i, I kind of wanted to, to back it up just a little bit again um sure. man the ocs how how long have you guys been how long have you been running this project man uh in, in one variation or another since like i think 96 96 97 wow 697 yeah it was just started as like a solo noise project in providence rhode island basically it it, it lined up with me getting my first four track from a girl named Courtney I was dating, who she changed the trajectory of my life with that birthday present. <laughs> I always heard about what a four track was, but once I understood, I was like, wait, you can just play four things layered over each other on a cassette tape? I was like, this is amazing. And it just changed my life for like being able to record alone and not need other people necessarily. Exactly. But certainly made a lot of records like that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that was like the first run, and I only did maybe two or three shows in Providence under that moniker. Mostly like noise shows, because it was people from Fort Thunder, like Brian Chippendale and Matt Brinkman from Force Field, or Peterson. Um, you know, it was like a collective of like experimental musicians living right, in Providence. Right, right. Mostly RISD kids. Um, I have them to thank for so much. You know, so many people, basically Providence is responsible for everything I learned. By the time I made San Francisco, I had already formed my sort of stage persona and and grew the balls to do whatever the fuck I wanted on stage. Exactly. Providence, from friends of mine in Providence who were like, I just remember Dan from the band landed one time with the most Providence accent ever being like, don't care what you look like when you get up on stage. Just go fucking nuts. You know, like, like, just go crazy. Scare the people. You know, he'd be like, give them something to remember. And then, of course, he would, like, throw a cinder block into the crowd. Right, right. He's like, like just like this. And you're at the sideline. Yeah. You can do that. I can wear pajamas. I mean, what the fuck? 
you know, so that's incredible. Yeah, I first bought there, and that was the beginning of OCs, and somehow the name just stuck. Whether it be out of laziness or necessity, that was the name for good, you know. Wow, it's incredible. I mean, and dude, and the the lineups over the years too. I mean, the OCs has gone through so many different sonic evolutions over the years too i mean it's it's incredible man what was the uh i always relate that to the marky smith quote even if it's just me and your grandmother playing bongos it's the fucking fall <laughs> that'd be like it's the fall as long as i'm standing there you know <laughs> i dig that man that's cool if you what is some of your favorite work man not to not to you know put you in this you know what, what, what would you out of, cause you, it's, you're so prolific, man. You put out so much incredible, incredible music. Do you have your own favorites? Do you have things that kind of help you bookmark your, not necessarily even your career, but your life in terms of, you know, this is where I was, you, you know what I mean? Like, because you have so much, so much to, to give. I don't go back a lot and listen to stuff that I've done. I'll like, I'll listen to it until the record's done. And then I, I'll maybe occasionally go back out of like morbid curiosity and listen to where we were at, at the time or just to hear the production or something. But honestly, man, it's, I'm always moving forward. I was just so about I'm to fine. say, it sounds like you just like, all right, we're done tour, move it. What's next? You know, so I think it, it lives a life of its own afterwards on stage. And that's right. Kind of for- that's the part. I mean, the records are really fun. I love writing the records. I love recording. I like working with the band. I like working with an engineer. I like working with other producers as well. But for me, it's always about how it grows. Because often when we're recording stuff, or at least these days, when we record a record, it hasn't been played live. It hasn't been. So this new record we just worked on, for instance, that's, that'll be coming out later this year. Uh, we wrote that. I wrote that with mostly with Tom to begin with at my house in the space of about a month. We just demoed out really, really simplistic demos. And then we had about maybe 20 days of rehearsals with the band just to sort of iron everything out and glue everything together. And then we just went in the studio and did it. And it sounds fucking great. But those songs don't really have a life yet because they haven't been performed live. And that's right. where really change and grow. And we develop the real voice because post-production and, and recording in the studio is always going to be different than the reality of somebody standing in front of you while you do it. And that's where the meat and potatoes is for me is like being able to pull it off in front of a crowd and have them feel their energy come back to you and where other people are involved. That's so that's for me is like having a really great show is better than a record. So I like a lot of records a lot. I love video shows. Um there are certainly bookmarks all the way for OCs. I would say for instance, uh to hear like moments of change like a big riff from like let's say like dog poison to carrying crawler the dream to mutilator there's like three yeah. generations of band there that are very drastic turning points and then all the way up to like uh orc and protean threat and our last record for instance which was wildly different it's like i i don't mind switching it up but those are like you know there's 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 moments where we settle down a little bit and find a groove Hmm. And then the, the records that shift wildly are usually kind of my favorites, I think. Yeah, but definitely. Them, and really, most of those have been like for me past the point of having been recorded and then have a book stage. Wow. And of course, you know, obviously, you know, releasing some of that material, you know, on In the Red. I mean, then it really kind of, you guys really started just releasing stuff on Castle Face kind of exclusively at, at, at one point in time, correct? Yeah, yeah, I can tell you right now that we're not doing the next record on Castle Face. So, well, there you go. But that, that's a little interesting factoid for you. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and and I mean, obviously, when you're touring, you want to play the record that you just recorded or the record that you've that you've made. But I mean, are you with such a crazy <laughs> prolific body of work? Do you piece? Do you do you just kind of? look at all the records and kind of piece together a set list of say 10 or 12 years worth of material. Have you guys, how do you kind of build a set list when you're not necessarily touring on like brand new material that you're trying to get across? We, 
there's some stuff sometimes that you think is going to work live and it just doesn't like if it doesn't grab the crowd we usually won't play it just kind of skip it or move around it yeah like if people aren't psyched then we won't play it so that's right we're still playing fucking tidal wave of the cream which i still enjoy but they certainly wouldn't be in my top tier of songs i want to hear us play right but right it's a crowd you know the crowd it's a, you have to get up there you got to give them what they want you got to give them the but show yeah them. absolutely the deep cuts and some weird shit they haven't heard um we have cobbled the set together just via uh process of elimination you know which right right, right. and we learn it so we have songs that are in heavy rotation for years we have songs that are in like sort of second tier rotation that like yeah the last excuse is a perfect example of a song that uh like every two years i'll be like let's put that one back on the set list and then we'll be like why did we stop playing this one <laughs> right you just kind of re re fall in love with it and kind of reestablish it you know we do have a wide swath of songs to pick from which is kind of nice we're pretty lucky that way we're like we can afford to change the setup and still have it be sort of all killer no filler right shit and do you and i mean i imagine do you have to relearn a lot of the songs that you've written i mean or do you kind of yeah. you do yeah i mean i imagine it's I, that always tripped me out about sonic youth with just the different the different tunings i mean it's i mean obviously that's why they had so many guitars but it's like yeah so what is your process when it's like oh man we need to let's let's break that one out that one's you know what i mean like yeah. let's find the tuning again and let's let's kind of dial this in so many times i've had no idea what the fuck i did it happens <laughs> Like, well, I, that's how sometimes we do covers, too. We did a cover on this new record, and I was trying to figure out how the hell how the hell I played it, uh, or how the hell the band played it, and then finally I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna, I, I like, made a tuning to cover this song, because I couldn't figure out how to play it, standard tuning. Um, we, I do that with my own songs. Like, I'm sure I've done songs again in, the, in a different tuning just to accommodate my brain now. Right, you right. Know, or your, your everything changes slowly over time so why not shift with it you know that's incredible man yeah that's yeah it's it, yeah you're <laughs> i'm opening a package right now and uh i bought all of the dio records this week because i haven't had them since i was a kid and i just watched that dio documentary oh I dude year. i totally forgot yes i need to put that back on my list of things yeah i heard about that man it made me. It made me immediately be like, "Well, I guess I'm buying those first three Deal records again." Like I haven't had them since I had them on cassette when I was a kid. Yeah, dude, oh, they're so fucking good, man. I, I didn't realize how charming that man was. I never knew. I never saw him speak or anything before. The dude's been around since the fifties. Dude, do, are you familiar with this? Uh, his early LA band, Elf. Yeah, I just I literally just went down a rabbit hole with them as well. They're fucking so, great, man. Like. I don't think I groovy boogie woogie heavy rock band. yeah dude boogie for sure man yeah elf is that that first record or maybe that might be the only record they did but it's so good man such a classic man that's awesome well john checking. what's up <laughs> worth checking out that do doc that's all. i don't know why i just had to mention it because I'm, I'm looking at the record right now and i was like psyched seeing her well i i do until you just mentioned it, i totally forgot about it man it's that was on my radar for a minute and totally Every slipped my mind from- million new fucking things that you to look at it's, it's you're inundated with information all day every day now <laughs> that's how i felt about the phil lennett documentary that she was working on it during the pandemic and it kind of just got shut down and it was one of those things where it was only being shown in like selected theaters and i was like shit man like thin lizzie's one of my favorite bands like i have to see this and then it came out and i was like here take take my money like this i've been waiting on this documentary for like two years like one of the best ones out there it's so good if you've not seen it playing Finn lizzie at the gym i went to this morning it made me totally say <laughs> dude it's so and dude that and i'll admit it man over the years i took that band for fucking granted dude i was like oh boys are back in town like whatever no man like don't listen to that song <laughs> <laughs> like listen to all the Decca records before they got signed to Vertigo. I mean, dude, Thin Lizzy is one of the greatest fucking bands ever. And you don't even have to listen to Boys Were Back in Town or Dance in the That's, Moonlight. I mean, it's uh, the uh, Alan Partridge quote where he's doing his British and he's like, it's time for a nice thick slice. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so good, man. So good. <laughs> So you gotta, you know, you gotta look back to the classics. Every now and then, you, I would see a show back in the day. Like I remember seeing Slayer or like Alice Cooper, uh, as far as metal goes. Just, yeah, yeah. It's a 
seeing like you know a master at work and you're like yeah that's great you know that's that and that's why they're up there man i when i was really getting into like obscure 60s and 70s music it i was getting to the point where i was like man fuck listening to grateful dead and jefferson airplane like it was getting to that point i was like i want to listen to all these other bands that are essentially on the same circuit with them but they're not getting any of that commercial attention and then you kind of have to get out of that you kind of have to go back and listen to you know general public and like tears for like you have to go back to the classics man like i always go back to new wave you know that's I love yeah. I new wave. If I had to, if I had to choose like gun to my head, it would be, it'd be the fucking cure and the Smiths. And yeah, absolutely. those are my favorite bands. You know what I mean? Like it's, that's just a big, fan, a big fan of all things new wave. I just went on a rabbit hole last night on, on the beloved YouTube of uh, just look up eighties Russian synth wave. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's some shit on there. Russia doing it as usual, Russia, you know, uh, present company accepted always doing their uh their own weird version of things because at the time nobody else was like talking to them because the iron curtain right so, like, exactly like, 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 like this is simply but it's very weird and like somehow still has a bit of like like a very russian traditional vibe to it huh. so you can tell it's like young kind of punk just very very cool i, I found a lot of random stuff. So i was sending it to my buddy who's russian last night and she was just like what the fuck? Where are you? <laughs> I like, I'm not even familiar with that. Dance. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's Russian guys. I mean, this weird shit. Dude, that's how it is with like a lot of the going back to the 60s and 70s, like all the other different countries around the world listening to fucking Jeff Beck and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. And when it gets over there to them, it's so much more abstract because they do have this interesting native land kind of element to it, like their own country kind of blends into that and it's usually in my opinion a lot more a lot more obscure and like yeah. abstract you know what i mean it's like because then they're like oh we like led zeppelin or we like a lot of these bands i'll interview it's the same fucking story over and over i saw you know elvis or the beatles on ed sullivan and you know on american tv channel and by the time the kinks rolled around and then the psychedelia of america it we formed Amandul or we formed, you know, whatever. And it's like, holy shit. It all comes from the same place, but it just translates. Yeah. Like as well. <laughs> like a 30th generation book like what's up on tape. Yes. It's crazy, man. It, it blows. It, it just blows my fucking mind. How, and even like the Zamrock stuff. I mean, I, I really like a lot of the Zamrock stuff. I'm, I imagine you, you listen to that stuff too. And it's the same story, man. These guys in like, south africa in the 70s listening to fucking Jimi hendrix and it's like oh my god <laughs> and they're making yeah. like psychedelic desert music it's just crazy man just crazy are you still there yeah oh cool i thought i lost you <laughs> nope, just, just agreeing with you silently yeah <laughs> cool man well john i don't i don't want to keep you too long man i want to let you get to your to your friday uh afternoon there um i really appreciate you taking this this i really appreciate you taking this hour man it's i really appreciate your time man right on dude a total pleasure man yeah let me know when it comes out and i'll post it on our end on the label yeah 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 and and we'll and we'll do this again man that's that's another thing is i always do just reoccurring guests just to continue okay. getting to know people and to talk more because that's that's always the goal because you just it's immediately intimate these things and it's immediately personal and emotional sometimes. So it's like, I always feel you just like immediately make friends with the people that you're talking to. So it's like, Oh shit. Like we're going to talk again for sure. <laughs> you know, the positive energy of the internet. Yes. <laughs> this is the opposite of 4chan, man. Well done. <laughs> well, John, I really appreciate it, man. I, you know, I've been a huge fan of your work for so long and, it was it was a trip that you were so down to do this kind of right off the yeah. bat. I, I appreciate that, man. I have four followers, so I hope that doesn't ruin this. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, brother. Not at all. 